So we have been asked to talk about something having to do or related to the High Holy Day Mahzer, the prayer book, or one of the themes of the High Holy Days. And so I'm going to be, as you can see on the top of the page, talking about the idea of fear and awe in one of our major prayers, which is the Unatana Tokef, um, which is recited in our Siddur and the Reform Movement's Mahzer right after uh, we do a vote and give a rote, and then we read that passage about Rabbi Amnon of Mainz. Actually, we don't. We don't read that passage. But um, it is about how it is that we face God on the Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur days of all. How it is that we confront God. How it is that we acknowledge what the day is really about. And these prayers are only said four times, five times a year. Um, four times a year. Rosh Hashanah morning, second day Rosh Hashanah, and then both Yom Kippur services. Okay, so they're only reserved for the days of all. You will see I have given you the Hebrew. There's only one word. I mean, we're going to read the whole paragraph and see how the translations grapple with the idea of fear and awe. I'm going to use this board over here. For those of you who can see it, great. If you can't, that's fine too. The only word that I want you to really focus on is the Hebrew word yira which is going to come up, uh, the root is Yura. <coughs> mm, I never do block letters. This is the root, and we're going to Yud, Resh, Aleph. Every Hebrew word has a root. Every Hebrew verb has a root. And this is Yud, Resh, Aleph, which we usually translate as fear or awe. And we'll talk a little bit about what awe means. I think we all know what fear means. Um, and the reason why we're going to focus on this word is because for those of us who enter the days of awe or the high holy days with a sense of fear that really, really, really God is sitting up in heaven with a book. And in that book is written whether we're going to live or die by fire or by storm or by flood or by stoning or by any of those terribly gruesome things that are in the prayer itself. I know, having gone to Orthodox Day School for the first 10 years of my life, fear of God, fear of punishment, fear of the correlation between my actions and bad things happening to me and my actions and me not going to heaven are front-loaded in my memory banks, right? So keeping kosher for me growing up was about punishment. Do it or else. Respecting my parents for me was about do it or face the fear of God, the wrath of God in this world or the world to come. In my childhood, you want to go to heaven, you keep the mitzvot. If you don't keep the mitzvot, you're not going to heaven. Okay, that's what I grew up with, and that's what a lot of us grew up thinking, and many of us come into the High Holy Days still thinking that. Why? Well, one of the things that supports that feeling of fear of God in this world or in the world to come is this prayer. Let's read it. Unatana tokef kidushat hayom kihu norav hayom. In the translation that we read in our Machser, it is translated as, let us proclaim the sacred power of this day. It is awesome and full of dread. That is not a happy feeling kind of prayer. That is a prayer that's saying, let us all as a community proclaim that this day is very, very, very harsh for those of us who have sinned. It is awesome and full of dread. Now the word nora is that word. Okay, that's the root, fear. It is filled, so when they say awesome, that is another translation of it. But another translation of it is, for it is filled with fear and dread. The Torah, the Bible, when it says the word yira, or what we call yirat Adonai, or yirat Hashem, fear of God, means literally fear God, in the same way that you feared your parents. Now, I know there's no one under a certain age here. 
if I talk to a group under the age of 20, they don't know what fear of parents means. <laughs> but if you talk to anyone over a certain age, they remember that when your dad went for his belt, he meant to take it out and use it. Okay, these kids have no concept of what that means. They don't know what it means to actually be really, really upset if your mom yelled at you. Like really upset, like internalizing it and all that stuff. They don't know from that these days. I sound like an old fart. They don't know from that. <laughs> but that's what the Torah means. Fear God in that kind of scary, scary way, because God is God. We're going to look at a text in a second that comes from the Kabbalah from Jewish mysticism, from Jewish mysticism's main book called the Zohar. And if you know anything at all about Kabbalah and about Jewish mysticism, you know that how you feel, how you experience, how you engage with your creator is not based in fear, but based in awe and splendor and love. They were the anti-intellectuals. They were the ones, the Kabbalists who wrote the Zohar, were the rabbis who, in their commentaries, wanted us to actually feel good about being Jewish and doing Jewish and connecting with God. They didn't want the fear of God, and we're going to look at why and how in a second. So, if you look in the second translation of that first sentence, which comes from uh, Rabbi Richard uh, Levy, who is uh, a teacher, was my teacher and Rabbi Keller's teacher, and Jason is taking classes with him as well. He's uh, on faculty at HUC in LA. He translates it in his Machzer, which was written for the Hillel movement. All the Hillels in the universe, uh, well, in the United States at least, use on wings of awe, it's called. Um, Let us declare the holy power of this day. It is awe-filled and mighty. So you can see, even in his translation, he tends to lean more toward a Kabbalistic translation. It is awe-filled and mighty sounds a lot nicer than awesome and full of dread. Yes. Right? And that is on purpose, and it is a very valid translation of Norave Ayom. It's fine to translate it that way. You'll see prayer books where they translate it even more fluffy, more warm and fuzzy. But they're trying to, in those doors, make you not fear God and not do things, or not do things, as it turns out, with regard to mitzvot, because of fear of punishment. And I know that sounds like the total antithesis to anything you've ever learned about Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, that we should go in ready to meet our maker. I know, I grew up learning the Yom Kippur is a rehearsal for dying. It is, a, it is an annual rehearsal for facing God and God weighing your good deeds and your bad deeds and deciding if you should go or not go to heaven, right? And for those of you who don't know this, Jews very much believe in heaven in Jewish uh, text and hell. In fact, we're going to see a reference to hell, but we call it something else. We call it Gehino. All right, enough of these prayers. You can look at these later. That's not even the... I just wanted to show you the different translations. Focus on that word, yira, nora. Okay, here we go. This is from the Zohar, and you can see on the top it's from uh, the chapter 11, verse 71, through chapter 12, verse 71. We're not going to read the whole thing. So, put on your Kabbalistic hat, which means don't worry about whether it's true or not, or it happened or not, or when you study this stuff, I think you're supposed to just sort of accept that it's saying what it's saying. <clears throat> and when I add or subtract or multiply or divide by it, you'll just accept it. Okay, I don't, I'm not the authority on this. I'm actually learning this with you for the first time. Okay, I've never taught this before. So, what is the first few words of the Torah, Hebrew or English? Anyone want to Breshit tell me? Breshit bara Elohim. Thus says the Torah chanter on second day of Rosh Hashanah when we read Breshit. Breshit bara Elohim. In the beginning, or we always translate it in the beginning or from the beginning, God created. Okay, the rabbis in this piece of Zohar are only interested in not even the bet of Bereshit. They want to translate what Reshit means. Now, Reshit in Hebrew typically is translated as first. So some translations go and say from the first, or from, you know, instead of from the beginning or in the beginning, we'll say in the first moment of creation, God created the heavens and the earth. They're only interested in what we can call here because we're amongst friends, reshidiness. What reshidiness means. That is the combination of a Hebrew word and an English word. It is not a word. I just made it up. Reshidness. 
They, that's all they care about is what happened at the beginning, right? And since Rosh Hashanah is a celebration or a commemoration of the beginning, they want to know what that is, what happened in the first moment. Now, when, we, uh, when you take the Kabbalah class that I'm going to teach later on in the year, you can, we are going to go a little bit more into that. There are chapters and chapters and chapters of commentaries on the first few verses of Genesis because they really want to unpack what happened at the beginning and they want to understand the nature of God and they want to understand, those of you who know a little bit of Kabbalah, you know about Simsum, that God like, contracts himself and then, and then is in this urn and then it blows up and explodes into all these little shards of glass and pieces and light and everything and a little bit of that is in each one of us. We'll talk about that. Um, that's ultimately their, their, their one of the Kabbalistic notions is that the world came from this huge explosion, which we call Big Bang. It's the same idea. Um, and then the explosion forced everything into existence. Okay, so in the beginning God created. First chapter of Genesis. Uh, the bold print sections are the text that comes from the Bible. Everything else is the Zohar, okay? So what does Reshit mean? They say this is the first commandment of all called awe of God, which is called beginning. So what they're saying is, Breshit, let's do it in English, beginning is synonymous with awe. And in fact, really, what we read in the Torah is, Breshit bara Elohim, with awe, splendor, whatever you want to call it, but let's call it awe because that's in the El, that's in the prayer that we were looking at. In awe or from awe or from aweness, God created the world. All right, and now they say to us, "Oh, not only do we think that, but the Bible itself thinks that." Let's pick out, and the rabbis do this all the time, right? They pick out other verses from the Bible to make their case. Um, I remember in rabbinic school, these are called pericope verses. These are the proof texts. These are the, the, the text. Look, if you're doing Kabbalah, you want to be able to prove and show people the secrets, right? And in order to know the secrets, you needed to know every word of the Torah back and forth, up and down. So they're going to take any passage that they can find in other parts of the Bible, in all 39 books, and prove their point. Their point here is that Reshit means awe, not in the beginning. Okay? That from awe, God created the world. How do we know this? Well, let's take, and you can look at the little footnote four, let's take Psalm 111, verse 10, which says, the beginning of wisdom is awe of God. We're gonna find another verse in the Bible where the word beginning appears and prove that it really means awe. Okay, does that make sense? Kinda? Now, oh, we have a second verse from Proverbs chapter one, verse seven that says, Awe of God is the beginning of knowledge. Okay, by the way, for the Kabbalists, you cannot achieve either knowledge or wisdom from a place of fear of God. You can't. It can only, only come from this almost, not almost, this uh, sexual connection with God. They're really into sex. They're really into the erotic, the Kabbalists. You have to be intimate with God, and you can't be intimate, really intimate, with someone who you're scared of, or something that you're scared of. So, you want wisdom, you want knowledge, which are, by the way, parts of God's character, and that we'll do in the class later on when we look at the spirit, the rungs, the descriptions of the parts of God. You want that, you have to have a sense of awe. It's like, you can be afraid of your spouse, because you know how they're going to react to certain things that you do, but really, to be in covenant with your spouse, to be in love with your spouse, means that you feel awe when they walk into a room. Okay? And they say, so look, we got these two, so they say these two texts, uh, they, 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 these two texts are used to support the definition that God created the world from a place of awe, or from pure awe. We'll stop right there for questions or comments. God felt awe. God did not feel anything. Well, you say God not, was awe. God equals awe. God equals awe. Yes. So you want to believe in God? You want to have a connection with God? You want to be in covenant with God? Then you have awe. 
So you wake up in the morning, as Heschel would say, right? Or as Michael Marmer, Dr. Marmer quoting Heschel would say, he said there are two types of people. According to Heschel, you wake up in the morning and you go, wow. You have a sense of awe, right? Or you wake up in the morning and you go, oi. <laughs> Which is more dread. And for Heschel, right, because Heschel believes in this God that is very personal with us and he's very mystical, he thinks that we wake up and have that sense of walking around constantly in wonder. Yeah, don't know. And God wants to have a relationship with us. Yes. But the first commandment Do you know why God wants to have a relationship with us? He loves us. Yes, it's that simple. He just loves us. Because the first commandment isn't a commandment. It's just like, I am the Lord. I'm here. Right. For you. I right. want a relationship with you. It's a statement of purpose. And to be in covenant, Don is making a very good point. The first commandment of the Ten Commandments is not a commandment. It's a statement of purpose. It's the ketubah. Right? I am God who brought you out of Egypt. I'm here. I'm I'm in love with you. I want to be in covenant with you. And now we'll go into the commandments. And as a sign of that of sign of that love, the actual ketubah will be the Torah. You know, that's actually the book that's going to make it happen. That is going to be what the foundation of our relationship is. And if you want to get to know me, God, I already know all of you. I'm God. You want to get to know me? You get you have to get to know Torah. I mean, really, really know me on that deeper level. It's like, it's like a marriage also. Like you really, really want to get to know your person that you're marrying, your partner. You got to spend really serious time with them. You have to ask them questions. You have to get to know what makes them tick. You have to know what their essence is and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm very confused. Good. Um, and I'll give you a little background. It's brought up in an important reform congregation in yes. Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was confirmed there and that I was married there. Um, I never heard anything about fearing my parents or fearing God. Uh, the Kabbalistic, your Kabbalistic approach, were we learning Kabbalistic Judaism? Because we were also out, out the back door learning that the Kabbalists were kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> Hippies. So is that, is that You grew up I in a classic from? Reformed congregation where God talk never happened. And if it did happen, it was if it did happen at all, it was it was um, incredibly mild. So you grew up the opposite of the way that I did. Growing up in an Orthodox day school, it's all we were taught, and a little bit of Hasidic stuff and a little bit of the other stuff, just to you know add a little dessert to the plate. In classic Reformed congregations, especially in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, God talk was minimal, minimal. God talk meaning really. We had a theology as Reformed Jews, social activism, social justice causes, the prophets, prophetic Judaism, Zionism after 37 when the, when the Reformed rabbis decided that Zionism wasn't a bad thing. So you may have grown up in a time when it was presented in, in whereas I grew up in a place where it was presented one way, it was presented another way. It could be that. May I ask, am I you alone may. in this room? I'm feeling like I'm the only one who doesn't fear God. No, okay. I don't. I, I didn't ask that question. God is good. God is great. Let us thank him for our food. I learned that right? in public school in second grade. Right. Right. And that's very well, appropriate. Know. Okay. No, I don't know who grew up thinking what are we this. What are we teaching now? What we are teaching now is a perspective on a word that brings a lot of us and a lot of Jews a little bit of angst when we walk into Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur services. When we say, I have sinned before you, I'm sorry, and then we read, sins against God are already forgiven. Why? Because as Donna said, God loves us, and if you love someone, you forgive them, so on and so forth. But we're reading one specific prayer that a lot of people I know grapple with. I know that for myself, that I grapple with. Let us declare the sacred power of the state is awesome and full of dread. I know for myself, I want to read it a little bit differently. But you can't mistranslate it is awful or awesome and full of dread because it is, dread is not a positive feeling. As far as the Kabbalists being weird, they were anti that. They wanted, and throughout history, they wanted us to have a different level of relationship with God that was based in awe, love, justice, and kindness, and all of the nice things. The, the nicer ideals that do very much exist in Judaism. Yeah. Would it be more covenantal? It takes two to make a covenant. Yeah. So it's that's our covenant between God and us. Without God, what are we? Without us, what's God? Right. 
Right. It, it's, it definitely goes both ways. The Israelites said in the Torah, Naseb and Ishma, we will do and we will listen. They entered into the covenant. The covenant, by the way, in a wedding is not dissimilar from the covenant at Sinai. There are three things that you need for a wedding to, for a couple to be married, for a kedushin, the sanctification of the marriage. You need a ketubah, you need a, so a signed document, you need the exchanging of uh, something of value, which is the ring, and you need sex. You need to consummate the marriage. Those are the three things that make someone married to another person, or in our case, to each other. That's it, right? So it, at Sinai, you needed God, you needed the people, and you needed Moses. You needed three things to happen. And so the people say, we will do when we'll listen. God says, And Moses is the intermediary, making sure he's like the officiant almost. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about the verse Just or the explanation of awe? Well, growing up reform mm -hmm. and not hearing a lot about God, I feel like when I went to the High Holiday Services, mm -hmm. this was there. Right. So not on a regular basis, perhaps, but... <clears throat> You know, but look, Susan, a lot of people complain that Ronnie and I don't talk about politics on the high holidays because they grew up in congregations with rabbis that were great in uh, social action and social justice. And so it would not be inappropriate for a certain demographic for me to get up and talk about health care reform or to talk about immigration or to talk about any of the political issues or even by name talk about a candidate. Rabbi Plotkin of Blessed Memory told me that in the 60s he did actually speak about Barry Goldwater um, during his sermon in 1968 and it was the only time that he took a side and was and we say well it breaks the law and you know we're a, we're a nonprofit we're not there's ministers all over the country uh, who are demagoguing one candidate and supporting the other so let's not go there but we do but people complain about that all the time to I me mean, why don't you guys do more current events those of us who grew up in the Reformed congregations, Rabbi Marty Wiener spoke about health care, spoke about the war in Iraq, spoke about, in fact, one of our little controversies in my last year there was Marty gave a very strong pro-Second Iraq War sermon on the high holidays in 02. And the next week, it wasn't the high holidays, I was smart enough not to do it then. It was Sukkot, I spoke totally against it. And I, because the movement, the reform movement was about to support it in a, in a resolution. And I talked about, we don't know there's any weapons of mass destruction, and this is going to lead to the entire region blowing up. And I was a little prophetic, I must say. And, but I wasn't the only one. I mean, there were a lot of people saying this. And um, both sermons were received very, so well and so difficult for a lot of people that we ended up having like a session the following week where both of us were there. And some people could yell at me and some people could yell at him. And the good thing was it was really cool because Marty was my rabbi for my confirmation. So I'm sitting there with my teacher, mentor, colleague, and, and it was like a, it was it was definitely an awesome. It was an awesome. But that's what they grew up with. I mean, and so when we talk about God, Torah, Israel, so on and so forth, we're in this new phase of the movement, I would say, where our kids are going to be much more comfortable with God talk than a lot of us are, especially when it comes to these two. OK, let me move on. So they say, for this entity is named beginnings. This entity, this reshitness that I was talking about, that's what the entity is. With these two texts are teaching us that you can't enter the world without a sense of reverence. That's as close as we'll get to fear. Reverence and awe for God. So let me say that again. For this entity, this reshit, is named beginnings in the Torah. It is the gate through which one enters faith. You enter faith through connection, spiritual connection with God in the way that you were describing, by acknowledging the goodness, the wonder. God represents justice. God represents compassion. God, which is very Jewish, very Jewish. The entire world is based upon this commandment. Now they go into an even greater statement that the entire world, not just for Jews, but for, for them, Christians and Muslims, because this was written way after Christianity and several hundred years after um, Islam came on the scene. The entire, and, and they are referring to those other religions, the entire world is based upon this commandment. What? That from awe, God created the world. From wonder. And, as I said again, that you cannot enter the world. God can't enter the world. God can't come on the scene 
without this huge sense of awe coming first. Now they're going to go on the other side, and they're going to tell you why fear of God is not just wrong and not just bad, but is not Jewish. It's not godly. Not worthy of God. Mm-hmm. Yes? So before you go into the yeah. fear stuff, it makes sense about having awe of God, because if you don't have awe of, you don't have that sense of, of that from that awe came the connection, then you can't see the miracles and the wonder that are going to happen. If you're only strictly logical, and you're trying to make the world a logical <laughs> thing, which I've seen lots of sure. things of lately, then you miss the miracles and the wonders, not only of, of the big picture, but of everyday life. So I think the part of Sally of what you're describing about people who miss, if they can't have a sense of awe, then they can't have a sense of awe happening. Yeah. Miracles, the little things that happen on a daily basis that we miss. And I think that describes atheism. I think that describes the more intellectual, scientific-based theories of things, yeah. um, where the emotion, not, not all the time, and I'm making a generalization, but where some of the time the mystery is taken out of it for the purposes of science. But in our case, he's talk, now he's going to talk about this, whoever wrote this is going to talk about why fearing God, which is what Jews prevalently do, and we'll see, hey, he's going to break it down. I put it into one, two. By the way, in the text, it's not listed. I did this to make it a little easier to understand of why that's not only a bad thing, but not worthy of God. So the question in the background is how many of us grew up worrying about consequences for actions, right? If you grew up in an Orthodox yeshiva environment and you sang as one of your fun songs, Hashem is here, Hashem is there, Hashem is really everywhere, up, up, down, down. That was not a fun, that was a fun song for kids, but the message of it, like, God is here, God is there, God is really everywhere, up, down, is God is everywhere and he knows the secrets. Not only does, and this can really mess you up, and not only the secrets, everything is written down, God knows the secrets, everything is written down, nothing stays in Vegas. <laughs> Nothing stays in Vegas. God knows. God and your mother. Right? Mother, maternal intuition is, is second to godliness. And it's a close second. Primary. Right? God's Absolutely. Feminine, God's feminine side. Maybe it's the Shekhinah. I don't know. But here's what he says. He says, the entire world is based upon this commandment. All branches in three directions... Yira. Let's just use right now the word yira because we haven't really defined what's good and bad about fear yet. Two of which are not fittingly rooted, which means two are bad, one of which is the essence of awe. Now, we've already kind of been talking about the essence of what yira means, of what awe means. All the nice stuff. So let's talk about what not to do. I grew up thinking there were consequences not only to my actions but to my thoughts. Okay. I grew up in that world of thinking, if I don't pray with a certain level of kavana, of intuition, of spirit, of knowing, of even knowing what I was saying, the prayer did not count. That's what I grew up with. Did anyone else here grow up in the Orthodox world? So Sam, you know what I'm talking about. We're speaking the same language. You grew up with that to some extent too. Now the Hebrew Academy of San Francisco is very smart because they hired a lot of Chabad rabbis from the Berkeley Lubavitch Chabad house to teach us, and they came in with the warm and fuzzy fluff. So there was a balance. When you're studying Talmud or Rashi, you get to do all that stuff. When the Chabad guys came in, we got to do the stories of the Rebbe and the guy who was poor and the guy who was rich and the poor guy got rich and the end. You know, we got to do that. But I grew up thinking God knows not only what I'm doing, but what I'm thinking. Mm. All right, and that takes a long time to purge. It really, really does. It's to this day why I don't keep kosher. Because I want, if I'm ever going to keep kosher, I am going to do it as a reformed Jew. I, I already know everything about kosher that I can possibly know at this point in my life. I'm sure there's more to learn, but I want to do it because of how it feels, that it feels authentic to me. Not, I never want to do it because I'm still afraid that I'm going to get punished for not doing it. Does that make sense? I want to do it organically. Everyone knows what I'm talking about, so therefore you will know there are two ways of defining a raw that are wrong, all based on consequences. First, there is the person who fears the Holy Bountiful One, that's just God, 
Um, but you know, you can see in the in the Kabbalah and the Zohar, they the holy bountiful one sounds very, very nice. Um, so that one's children may live or not die, or who fears physical or material punishment. When you have a kid who is sick and God forbid in the hospital, don't think that you have not thought to yourself for a second, this is either the result of something that I have done, or I need to go pray more. I need to go do more mitzvot. I need to be a better Jew so that my kid will get out of this pickle. We'll get out of this illness, this situation. Everyone does that. It is very natural. And if you are a person of faith, it is without a doubt that when your kid gets sick, really sick, or is hospitalized, that you make a correlation in your mind, even if you think this is not intellectual, this is emotional, that I need to go to services this week. I need to go online and learn a passage of Torah. I need to get more connected to my Judaism so my kid will be off the hook. Or what did we do to deserve this? Or what did I do to deserve that? That's, that's not the consequence part, though. That's, that's, a, that's a different, for them, it's a different part of theology. This is just okay. about consequences. My kid is sick. I need to fix it by doing more, praying more, um, learning more, uh, it's why Jews are very vigilant, perform conservative orthodox about the death rituals, about funerals, about making sure that we dot all the I's and cross the T's. For the most part, um, they have a lot of questions. They want to make sure that they're doing it right. They don't want to do it wrong. I just uh, uh, have this conversation a lot where people say, for example, if someone dies today, um, well, I'm going to tell you, someone died today. And so I was talking to the daughter, and she said, is it okay if we wait until Tuesday? Um, because we have some relatives that are coming in from out of town. I said, of course, okay to wait till Tuesday. But in the back of her mind, it has to be done by tomorrow night. If you're a halachic Jew, by the second sunset. And in the back of her head, she was thinking, is it kosher if we wait until Tuesday? Of course it's kosher. I mean, that's, that's silliness. When they didn't have refrigeration, it wasn't kosher, believe me. But now it's kosher. Um, because of this, this person fears God constantly. I mean, you want to talk about neuroses? This God, this person fears God constantly, but the awe is not focused on God. I love that line. It is one of the essences of Kabbalah, by the way. This person worries constantly. Of course they're worrying. Their kid is sick. Of course they're fearful. Their kid is sick. But, but, doing a mitzvah because your kid is sick, for the Zohar, for the rabbis writing this, is not focused on God. It is focused on you. God doesn't need that. God does not operate that way. Going back to what Donna said, I'm so glad you said it. And it, given the, the grade that you teach, I'm really happy that you said it. <laughs> you have to tell them that God loves us unconditionally. Unconditionally. We do not believe in a God that punishes kids with sickness because we're not keeping kosher. That is not something that is acceptable to the Kabbalists. It's not acceptable to think of a God who makes your kid sick and end up in the hospital because of something that you did or did not do. No. That is fear of God. Lots of people think that, but that is not, as it says here, focused on the holy bountiful one. That is not focused on God. Let me go to the second one and then we'll open up for some more questions. Second, then there is the person who fears the holy bountiful one because of fear of punishment of the other world and the punishment of hell. That is the person who fears what they are doing or not doing because of heaven and hell. So the first is fearful of this world stuff, stuff, consequences in this world. If I do or don't do the next, like they walk into Rosh Hashanah and they read, this is a day of dread, who will live, who will die, it is sealed and is sealed. And of course they're thinking, what if I'm on that list? The naughty or nice, the Jewish naughty or nice list. What if I'm on the naughty list? What if between now and next Rosh Hashanah, I die? It's actually probably next Yom Kippur to some who believe that the book is sealed on Yom Kippur. It's actually sealed according to tradition on the seventh day of Sukkot on Hashanah Rabbah. But nonetheless, not one of us hasn't read that prayer. I'm going to make a generalization. I am assuming not any of us at any time has not thought about that prayer and not thought, oh, God, am I on the list? <laughs> and that's what they're doing. By the way, now I'm on the list, am I going to heaven or am I going to hell? Yes, in Judaism, in the Kabbalah, they meant eternal damnation, hellfire. It's called Gehino or Gehenna for us. And so the person who is not aspirational, 
but fearful in the way that they conduct their lives and follow mitzvot, that person is not showing awe of God. They are not, they don't get the relationship. They're missing the relationship. They're doing what they're doing because they're fearful of consequences in this world and in the world to come for themselves. And that is not okay. And so the last sentence there, neither of these is the essential root of all. The essential root of all, that beret sheet, and yura, the essential root of all, we're going to see, and we're not going to have time to finish it because I only have 10 minutes left, is not that. It's not that. It's going back to what Sally was saying. It is the ability to do what you're doing or not doing, as the case may be, because you have a sense of awe, and I would even say a sense of obligation to the covenant and to the law, to the aspirational part, where you aspire to be able to be someone who can walk the earth with a sense of Heschelian awe and know the miracles and not take them for granted. And be able to say, you know, when you're out there doing your gardening, for example, this is pretty cool. I am part of creation. I am actively participating in creation. That is a very, and here we go. I, I knew I was about to look at you because. <laughs> no, I just I, I'm. He's I'm, got I'm, great great gardening <laughs> skills. And and yummy veggies. About the garden. So I, I, I wanted to ask just on. Yeah, I was going to stop there anyway. So go ahead. And then I then I'm going to finish up one part. Okay. Okay. What? The, you know, you're saying there's no place for fear. And, and I, and I, I didn't say I, there's no place for fear. I'm just saying that, that's, that's not. That's what I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. So fear like if, if somebody mm -hmm. commits murder and, and breaks the commandments, I, I mean, you, you're talking about having love for, you know, following the mitzvah and stuff, but, you know, someone who doesn't. Right. And let's be honest. These are guys who are walking around thinking about our relationship with God in very sexual terms for the most part and in ways that are very, for their time, um, progressive would be a light way of putting it. There are, there, there are people walking around with a sense of joy, awe, inspiration that maybe I don't have. So, but that doesn't mean that they're not, they're actually acknowledging that there are a lot of people who live in their fears, not with their fears. That's how I would say it. So if I live in my fears, then everything I do or don't do is a sense of consequence. Is for the, there's going to be some consequence to it. Um, if I live with my fears, then hopefully I can balance my my fears, my anxieties, what I'm scared of, with still being able to have a sense of wonder and awe. And I think most of us fit into that category. You know, I think most of us look. We're Jewish. The, the neurosis is in our DNA. Being worried and when our kid is in the hospital, it is not a bad, I do not want you to think I'm saying it's a bad thing to pray more when your kid is sick. Or to think that if Ronnie and I show up and do a Misha Berach that it's gonna work. It does. There are more texts probably that would say, rabbinic texts that would say, yeah, a community that prays for the healing of a sick person, you know, is, is gonna be more powerful than just a single individual doing it. It's why we have a minion for praying in general. Like, it's, it, it doesn't mean it's bad for me to pray alone, it just means it's better for me to pray with a community. And it's better for me to pray for my kid with a community too, if they're sick. But when we go into the whole blame game or consequence thing, all they're saying is all the other texts that you've read in the Talmud or in commentaries or in Midrash that paint God in a very biblical way. I mean, God's not very nice in the Bible. God's definitely edgy. And God definitely overreacts. And God definitely, I mean, look at all those stories where God's saying, I'm going to kill all of them. And Moses says, wait, 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 wait. If you kill all of them, the PR is going to be, the PR department has said that the Egyptians will say, look at those stupid Jews for leaving Egypt just to get killed in the desert. Right? And so God backs off. God learns from Moses. Um, but, but, you know, I think living with fear is definitely something we all do. It's living in fear that I think they're addressing, especially when it comes to observing mitzvot. It's okay to keep kosher because a little bit of you thinks it's what God wants. I want to make sure I go to heaven. Like, I think that's okay. That's normal. But you should also keep kosher with a sense of awe, that you're actually doing something every time that you eat that connects you to God, to the awe of God. 
And I, I would imagine most Reformed Jews who observe Kashrut, and even conservative to some extent, and some Orthodox Jews as well, do it with a sense of awe and not fear. And that, I think, makes it a little bit more, like I say, organic. It makes it a little bit more worthy of God. Because for them, God is awe. God is Ein Sof. God is unending. And you can't define God. But you can try to understand God. Try to understand God. Okay? And when we get to the class and I have this Sphero written up, I'm going to show you where these ideas, which elements of God's personality, so to speak, these ideas are related to. That's like the next step. I should have done that first, but that's, that would have been the whole class, and then I would be able to teach it later. Yes? The Kabbalists. This is Kabbalists? This is uh, rabbis who wrote the Zohar. Rabbis who wrote the Zohar. Mm -hmm. Different than the Kabbalists? No. Kabbalah is the total genre okay. of Jewish mysticism. Okay. So, for example, the Hasidic uh, rabbis, the Baal Shem Tov and his followers, they wrote another book. Um, um, like, it was called, um, what's the Hasidic book of Touchy Feely? Um, Tanya? Tanya. Right? So the Tanya was written. <clears throat> the Tanya, that's their sort of stories of the Rebbe, the Baal Shem Tov going around in the peace, love, and granola and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, 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 there's all kinds of stuff. There's Jewish astrology writings. There's, by the way, that's a, that's, if I ever have the time to write a book, <laughs> one of the ideas is to take the concepts of astrology, like the 12 houses, take the 10 sphere wrote, the 10 emanations of God, and then go look for something else that's out there in Eastern philosophy and mash them all together. And so next time you go to a psychic, you'll know that you're not allowed to do it. It's not permitted in the Torah. You're not allowed to go to a soothsayer or a magician or a psychic. And then what do the rabbis do when they see a line like that? They end up doing it anyway, right? By the way, there are tons of legal documents in Judaism, not tons, but many, that say you're not allowed to talk about what happened before the beginning of creation. And this is what they're doing. They're talking about what happened before the beginning of creation because they're giving God an attribute called all. So we break our own laws all the time. Yeah, two more, and then I only have three minutes, and I want to just finish one more part. So, so awe isn't superficial, because mm -hmm. one of the prayers or one the of the readings we do during the holidays is talking about, is this the way I want you to address me? I, I'm not getting it right. You know, or the bowing and all that. He says, that's not what I want. I want you to do. That is from the book of Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah. It's, I'm so glad you brought that up, because it's so Hasidic and so this. Right. So it's on Yom Kippur. <laughs> And he basically says, Isaiah, and remember, he's preaching way, way, way before this is written. He's preaching to the Jews who were living in Babylonia in the 6th century. And he says, you think it's this stupid fast that I want? I don't want this fast. It means nothing to me. The fast is for you. I want you to remove the shackles of the poor. I want you to get in the dirt and get dirty and help people. I want you to... You think I want you to, to offer sacrifice? Your sacrifices are meaningless to me. Which, by the way, means your prayers are meaningless unless you are doing it. Have a sense of awe. So you're exactly right. That's what Isaiah is talking about probably 1,500 years before this is even written. Thank you for picking that up. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah. This is probably not exactly totally on topic, but... That's okay. Okay, you're saying people... Um, people don't always go and pray for the health of their child who's sure. in the hospital out of fear. They do it because they think prayer is going to help. Mm -hmm. And then prayer doesn't help. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then what are people supposed to think? Okay, oh, so again, it goes back to the premise, and I can't answer the whole thing now because that's a whole other topic. It really is because that topic has to do with the nature of God and the nature of prayer and the nature of um, what I would call the randomness or the chaos of the world, mm -hmm. right? God does not want kids to get sick, and also, God does not want you to think that God's not listening to your prayers. Otherwise, not only does it invalidate your prayers, but it makes people like me think, well, what's the purpose of praying anyway if God's not going to listen to me? You know, it's that old adage, it's trite, it's what our parents and grandparents thought is, God works in mysterious ways, what they're saying, although that sounds very trite, I think what they're trying to say is, if we could understand what triggers what to make X, Y, or Z happen, like what event, what circumstance, what lack of makes 
bad things happen to good people. Makes a kid get sick, and then after I pray for them, it makes me feel like God didn't listen to my prayers. If the only answer I have for you is, well, I can't explain it to you because God is mysterious, that is not a very good answer. So when we study this kind of stuff and we go into the deeper details, one of the things I think that we learn, and I hope that you leave with today, is that it's not about you when we're talking about God. In other words, <coughs> these are ideas, if I pray for then X, Y, or Z will happen. If it doesn't happen, then there must not be a God, or at least God's not listening to me, is a very, very human thing to say. And we always go to the extreme example with the Holocaust with this kind of stuff. I, I want to use just one, one sliver here. In Judaism, everyone knows about Yitzhak Hara, the evil inclination. And everyone knows about Lashon Hara, about gossip, evil speech. I did a session with the preschool teachers this week. They're doing the value of Lashon Atov this month. They're picking a different Jewish value every month and it gets highlighted in the little stuff that they do in the classroom. And, you know, the joke is, I didn't even know that we had Lashon HaTov in Judaism. I didn't even know that we had nice speech in Judaism. I knew we had gossip. I mean, that's, you know. And, and we focus so much on gossip and bad speech and, and that we forget what good speech is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what it means, and I was talking about direct and focused praise. Not that you're the greatest kid in the world and you're the smartest, but hey, you did that exercise really nicely. Or you, we, we, the yin and the yang and the positives and the negatives and the good and the bad are all in our world. But when we acknowledge and believe in the, in the ex, not just the existence of God, but the awe of God, then we have to be willing to accept the things that we can't control and that God can't control. And that's important. Because a lot of us grew up with this all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful God. And there are times when God doesn't want your kid to die either. God doesn't want your son or your daughter to get died. Uh, Elie Wiesel said, uh, of blessed memory, uh, God, was, God was in Auschwitz crying with you. God was actually hidden. Because evil had, for a moment, trumped over, overruled good. And those are the things that we can't quite understand, other than to understand that we have no control over the same thing sometimes that God doesn't have any control over either. And I know that that's a whole different theology. That's what I'm saying, it's a different talk. Because if Jewish theology that we grew up with was omniscient, om omni-everything, and I'm telling you, no. Omniscient, omnipresent, all-knowing, all-powerful means, doesn't mean that. I mean, that exists, but that's not what Jewish theology is predicated on. That What Jewish theology is predicated is that God exists, that we have awe of God, that we're able to acknowledge the wonders and the splendors and all those things. That's God. The other stuff, that's not. And God doesn't have control over pure evil and chaos and all of these things that we're struggling with today. There is no God in ISIS. There is no God in ISIS. And therefore, God can't do anything about it. That's a hard concept. That's a different concept than what I wanted to talk about, but I'm glad you brought it up because we can, at least Steve can put it on a list of things to talk about another time. Let me finish up because I'm three minutes over. The last thing I want to say, neither is it. The essence, second part of this line here, the essence of awe, because I, but you need the punchline, what is the essence of yara? The essence of awe is that a person be in awe of one's Lord or God because God is immense and sovereign essence and root of all worlds before whom everything is considered as nothing. What is Yerat Hashem? What is fear of God? But we're translating it as awe of God. What is it? That God is nowhere not to be found. Ein Sof. God is no thing. Not nothing. That's They translate the word nothing. I'm going to say break it down into no thing. God is no one thing. You cannot define God as one thing. So God is nowhere not to be found, but just because God is everywhere doesn't mean that God is sitting there keeping a checklist of you, good or bad, naughty or nice, who will live, who will die. And that also applies to us that we need, since this is happening, we need that sense of awe always, at all times. Okay, immense and, hold on one second, immense and sovereign, that God is immense and sovereign means God is everywhere, 
that potentiality, that brachidiness, the brachidiness is everywhere. That sense of awe is everywhere. And as Sally said, we just have to be able to open our eyes and see it. And we need to have that sense all the time. And when we have that sense all the time, and God has obviously has that sense all the time, then the true awe happens. We may call it transcendence, we may call it spirituality, we may call it Judaism, we may call it prayer, we may call it pure, but that's when that happens. So what I want to say is, when you go into the High Holy Days this year and you open up your machzor, and you read it in Kedushat HaYom Kihu Yom, read it for what it is. It's meant to say fearful and full of dread and all that stuff. And then try to transport yourself into a place, at least inside of yourself, where you try to have true, real meeting with your creator. Have a moment of awe. Maybe it's the music. Maybe it's the kids walking in for the shofar service. Maybe it's holding hands with your husband, wife, son, daughter. Maybe it's, if you're me, holding hands with Rabbi Keller. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's, did you hear that? It's fine. I need to read you the one full of awe. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's none of the above, and you're just going to aspire to it. But try to have a sense of awe, and try to slowly but surely, if you're there, take yourself out of the place of fear. Mm -hmm. Try to take yourself out of the place of worrying about consequences. If you worry about consequences, the Kabbalah is saying, if you worry about consequences, you'll never do anything productive. Correct. Mm -hmm. If you worry about yeah. consequences, you're not going to do anything productive. And you're not going to actually have true meeting with God. And that's what we're really aspiring to during the days of